98% of indie games will not generate enough money to fund a second project. This means you'll probably fail as an indie game dev. I'm sorry to say that, but the odds are clearly against you and against me. Does this mean that you should not do game dev at all? No, I don't think so. There are many ways to succeed and we'll talk about just that. This is the experience of a lifetime for me. I absolutely love this so much more than anything I've ever done. In my first month in the studio, I learned more than I did in the past two, three years before that. So we double our Patreon income using the Steam income. But before that, let me talk to you briefly about today's sponsor, Mutate. If you want to create games without the hassle of learning Unity, Unreal or programming, Mutate is the thing for you. It's a gaming platform where you create voxel games without writing a single line of code. Mutate is made from scratch to provide the easiest and most intuitive experience with a simple yet powerful visual linking system. It comes packed with lots of functionalities for you to make your game a reality. The whole experience is social and multiplayer, meaning you can play and create with your friends, all in the same place. Don't worry if you're a lone wolf, you can also express your creativity alone. But what about the graphics, I hear you say? Mutate is clean, simple and it looks great, with tons of awesome assets ready for you to use. The best thing is that you can make your own super easily. If you feel overwhelmed, don't worry, you can remix any existing game on the platform to give it your own twist. Oh, and the best part of all, it's completely free. Mutate is still in active development with tons of cool features coming soon, like more game logic, assets, an improved visual language, and much more. They listen to your feedback so you can have a direct input in the development. There's already a super friendly community that can help you, give you advices, create game jams, and maybe help you find a team to create something really awesome together. Check out Mutate now, it's free, and you could be making your first game today. Click the link in the description to finally start creating hot in here. Let me give you the detail of the numbers. 70% of all indie games are commercial failures. Of the 30% that are considered successful, only 7% of those games will generate enough revenue to fund a second project. With that in mind, it feels quite unreasonable to go the indie route. Luckily, there are many ways to work in game development without going solo indie. First of all, keeping it a hobby is something we often don't want to hear about, but is probably more than enough for a lot of people. It's also a smart choice to keep the fun of game dev. You see, when something becomes your work, it can easily turn into more of a pain than anything. If you rely on your game creation to make money, you now need to make a game that should sell. It means you'll probably have to adapt to the audience, and even before that, find the audience. Then do marketing, spend time building stuff that wouldn't be required, like translation, and store integrations, etc. You now have a pressure on you, reminding you that you should make something commercially viable and quite fast, otherwise you'll run out of money. By keeping it a hobby, you can focus on what you like about game development, maybe make small games here and there, participate in game jams, you just have fun and learn stuff. You probably won't make the same decisions if the game you work on has to make money. I think that's the beauty of some of the games made during jams. You can clearly see some decisions were made because the game doesn't have to make money. You can get as crazy, weird or specific as you want with a personal project. It's also a different commitment. When you do something for yourself, you can always just abandon the project and move on to something else. You won't feel obligated to finish and in some case, it's a good thing. Of course, I totally understand. This is not necessarily what you want to hear and I was like that too. I could have stayed with a dev job and do game dev on the side. Probably it would have been the smartest option, at least the less risky one, but okay. Okay, I understand, you want it to be more than a hobby and it's totally possible to work in the game industry without being indie. I think the more traditional route would be to join a studio. It doesn't have to be a massive AAA one and maybe it's easier to start with a smaller one. So you don't necessarily need to have a game dev degree to work in a studio. There are quite a few people who don't have any degree. Specifically, you can look at any starter QA job. But if you're looking to get more specialized jobs, it is more likely that you will get the job 
if you have a lot of experience. A proven way to get that experience is by going to university, not specifically game dev university, any sort of computer science degree. The biggest advantage when working in a studio is that you'll usually have a very specific role. For example, you're a character designer, a level designer, or a programmer. Compared to the solo route where you have to handle everything, in a studio, you don't have to. So by far the biggest benefit of working in a studio is working with highly experienced developers. In my first month in the studio, I learned more than I did in the past two, three years before that. And some of the people that I was working with had been working on Unreal Engine for, I don't know, 10 years since its early days. And really they opened my eyes to a new way of developing and problem solving with the engine. Having to focus on your craft and not do business is a huge bonus and will help you a lot mastering whatever you're working on. It also means being employed and thus having a bunch of advantages compared to running your own company. Your salary is fixed and doesn't depend on your ability to sell a game. It comes with many challenges, but it's probably safer in terms of income reliability. The safest option if you need an income is studio, but if you want to unleash your creativity and you don't want to go into being complacent, then the safest option for that is going to be going solo. Of course, there are drawbacks. First, you don't decide what you work on. You might have an input in the creative process, but in the end, you're not the one deciding. The biggest drawback is not really being able to unleash your creativity wherever you want. When you have a new idea, usually it has to go up the food chain so that the directors make the decision as to whether or not it gets implemented in the actual game. Albeit Rare was really good where I worked, they were very open to new ideas, but I've heard of stories, for example, in Ubisoft where you literally have zero input into the game and you just have to do what they tell you. It's a safer job until you get fired for whatever reason. Game Dev Studios are also sadly well known to be crunching station. No, not this kind, the bad kind. You thought about it and you really want to go indie slash solo. First of all, I feel you. I decided to go solo because to me, it was the easiest to get a foot in the industry. This fits me well because I'm a solo learner and I love discovering stuff on my own. Also, I really wanted to build a business and even though it's probably not the best choice for making a lot of money, game dev sounded really exciting. I have a resume of five years of successful Salesforce development work. Do need to hop back into that world. I can use my previous experience to do that. So very calculated risk and uh, no, it is not a, a, safe, a safe option. I think the part that indie dev often forget about is the business. When you want to create games for a living, you have to understand that you are now a business and you must take decisions accordingly. One of the things I really, really like about doing and being indie is that it is an entrepreneurship experience. This is the experience of a lifetime for me. I absolutely love this so much more than anything I've ever done. We talked earlier about how many games fail money-wise, and it's probably a combination of the game simply not being good enough, not enough marketing, and a lack of target audience for the game. If you followed me and my game's development, you've probably heard me saying that Dashbong was not a good decision in terms of business and making money. I still believe it to this day, and of course, we'll see if it's true after the release. I knew from the beginning that the game was not going to be enough for me to make a living, but I found the idea too cool to not work on it. I also believed it's a good game to get started making games professionally because of its simplicity. So even if the decision in itself seems not logical, it's actually part of the plan. Dashbong is here to help me gain confidence by showing to me and people around me that I can go from an idea to a finished product that people will pay for. And because I know it's not going to be enough, I started to develop other sources of income such as freelance, YouTube, and maybe courses in the future. I think the big mistake would be say I'm making a game and that's going to be what's going to fund the studio. I believe this is something developers often fail to realize when going indie. Making games might not be enough, especially at the beginning. While working on your first game, you don't have any revenue to pay for the development costs. And unless it's a very successful game, it might not be enough to fund a second one. So you have to diversify and also probably seek funding. That's why we see so many developers doing Kickstarters. By onboarding people early Early in the development, you assure yourself some money, helping you throughout the creation process. Unless you're making something that's going to be a hit, you're probably going to struggle a bit financially. 
There's an interesting way of doing things that I want to discuss, and that's what the Sockpop Collective is doing. Sockpop is a video game collective of four developers, making a new game every month, and you can gain access to it by supporting their Patreon for $3 a month. Every developer at Sockpop is working on its own game, with a relatively short development cycle, something like 5 months maximum. By doing that, they ensure they have a game ready roughly every month. They have a steady source of income, thanks to the Patreon, and they also have the revenue of the game through Steam and other platforms. Right now they have around 2600 Patreons for a total of $8400 per month. It's written on their page that it's enough for them to get a minimum wage, so it's bringing a safety net, allowing them to focus their time and effort on making games, and only that. I don't think we're trying to make hit games, we're just trying to make really good games, and then if that happens to be a hit, that would be nice. But yeah, you can't always make sure it's a hit or something. If there was a formula, then somebody would have exploited it already. <laughs> the revenue they make from the Steam games is shared between them, no matter what member worked on the game. Recently, one of their games, Stacklands, was a huge success, and they talked about it more in details in the Game Discover newsletter. In there, they revealed the game did about 1.5 million in Steam net revenue. I think this way of developing games is really interesting. You keep the freedom of developing games on your own as a solo indie, but you multiply your chances of success by being part of a collective that is sharing revenue. This allows you to work on games that might be hard to sell by themselves, but now they're part of a collection of bundles you can buy for cheaper and a subscription. Do you believe this way of creating small games every few months is giving you more creative freedom? Them. We have all these people on Patreon that support us. I think they're just really interested in seeing us make like new, unique stuff. So in that way, we have a lot of quality of freedom for sure. You show the player it's possible to enjoy smaller and different experiences that AAA games. You assure a certain financial stability by having Patreon supporters, but you also have the chance of your game blowing up and bringing way more money than expected. As an indie myself, as a businessman, if I can say, <laughs> I'm interested in the, in the money aspect. How yeah. long has this model been sustainable? We started in 2018. At that point, we were still doing a lot of sort of freelance, like work for high for iron next of it on the on the by doing the Patreon page, and and totally it sort of shift, sort of shifted the sort of freelance project to to our more own so that's like the Patreon. I think I think a sort of sort of game change happened when when we when we released our game start in 2020. So before we were making like I don't know, like maybe five thousand per month per month Patreon. And once we once we released Steam, we also made about made about thousand on Steam every month. At that point, we we're like, okay, well, so this is actually sustainable, and we can live off of this. I didn't mention their games are usually between three and five euros on Steam, and I believe this is a very important aspect of their business model. By having cheap, short games, it's easier for them to become very popular. As a player, you don't risk a lot by buying their games, but if you try and like it, you might want to become a monthly supporter to have access to all of their games. This method is not totally uncommon and we see that with many YouTubers. Patreon supporters get the content earlier than the others and they also get exclusive content, like behind the scenes and special videos. As a game creator, you can leverage this by giving access to early builds of your game, letting the player be part of the creation process. You can also share with them exclusive content, such as source code, concept arts, music, special content that will be in the final game. Talking about YouTubers, this is also something that we've seen more recently. Some of them do game dev exclusively for YouTube and don't create commercial games. I can cite Danny as an example, but also Bargy, who recently announced going full-time on YouTube. Of course, just as with game dev professionally, it's not for everyone and it's quite a different job than just making games. You now have to know how how to make videos and be entertaining enough so that your content will be interesting. This comes with a lot of challenges. But as with the Patreon idea, the YouTube money and sponsorship can bring a more regular source of income that one game every few months or years. I deviated a bit from the main point of the video by talking about ways solo and small studios can make money, but I thought this was an interesting thing I could share to show that the indie route doesn't have to be so hard. This doesn't mean that going solo is going to be easy, you still have to make games, and I talked about how hard it was in my game development is hard video, so I think you understand how difficult it can be. 
I wanted to show that game dev can be lots of different things. Whether it's a hobby, a side hustle, your job, or your own company, it's up to you. I think the most important thing is to face the facts and be aware of the difficulties of this career. But then, the only way to make sure that something is or is not for you is to try. You can start by making games today. It doesn't have to be this massive dream or something financially viable. You can just enjoy learning a new topic and be proud of the little experiences you'll create. Thanks for watching, like, subscribe, wishlist Dashpong. Bye!